Hello everyone, this is Dr. Rebecca Sheffield. Welcome back to another episode of the It's My Job podcast. If you're interested in the careers of people who are blind or visually impaired, then you've come to the right place. Our podcast features student interviewers talking with adults who are blind or visually impaired, investigating important questions like how they use technology and how they connect with other people. Our interviews were designed by students for students. Stay tuned after the podcast to learn how to get involved. And please share with your friends and teachers so they can listen too. Now for today's interview. In this episode, Christian, a student in Texas, is interviewing Mr. Grant Hardy. Grant is a Vancouver Bureau reporter and broadcast presenter for Accessible Media Incorporated, a not-for-profit media company in Canada. You can follow him on Twitter at A-M-I Grant Hardy. That's A-M-I-G-R-A-N-T-H-A-R-D-Y. Grant is a presenter on the show AMI This Week, which has the Twitter handle at AMI This Week, and the Twitter handle for all of AMI is at Accessible Media. Also, check out Grant's work on AMI This Week and other shows at AMI.ca. On to the interview. So my first question is, where did you go to college and what is your degree in? Well, I went to the University of British Columbia, uh, UBC, and I actually have a Bachelor of Arts in philosophy. I'd always pretty much settled on doing a Bachelor of Arts because I wasn't sure what I was going to do at that point. But I kind of just stumbled into philosophy because I took a few courses like biomedical ethics and philosophy of science and a couple others that kind of hooked me and caught my interest. And what is accessible media? Can I access it or use it even though I don't live in Canada? Because I think that's where you live, right? You live in Canada? Yes, sir. Accessible media, it's a multimedia company and it was started decades ago when I believe there'd been some research done in Canada that essentially it's critical to be able to access the media in order to participate in a democracy. And so when it began, it began as a reading service for reading newspapers and stuff like that for people who are blind or partially sighted. Now, as you know, that content is pretty readily available online. And so it's morphed into, we have a couple of television channels. They're must carry, so they have to be carried on all Canadian cable and satellite providers, plus an audio channel, and we create accessible media for all Canadians. So a lot of programming from the community that's empowering portrayals of people with disabilities. It's a mix of newsy and lifestyle programming, showcasing people with disabilities who are working or doing amazing things, also talking about struggles and issues going on. And the the show that I work on is called AMI This Week. And it's a half an hour weekly show. And it's kind of like a lifestyle magazine. So I work in Vancouver, but there are offices in Edmonton, Halifax, Ottawa, and Toronto, which are all Canadian cities. And we go between offices and there's like one story per bureau in the show, just showcasing some kind of empowering portrayal of someone with a disability or maybe a tour of somewhere in the community, like a science center from my perspective. Yeah, so just a light magazine style show. And yes, you can access it online. We have an app for iOS, an Android app coming soon, and we're on pretty much all social media, Facebook, Twitter, and you can access us at ami.ca and on YouTube as well. What's the iOS app called? Just called the AMI TV. I think if you search for AMI in the app store, it should come right up. And I'm guessing you don't have to be localized in Canada in order to get that. Like I can get that here in the U.S. Um, yeah, I've never heard of really any kind of geo-blocking restriction. We every now and then get someone from you know, the other side of the the world who's told us that they've tuned into something. So yeah, you should be able to access it with no issues. 
What kind of certifications did you need for your job? Well, typically, you would probably need something like a journalism degree. I guess my story is a bit unique. When I was a kid, I was really interested in doing voiceover work. It's kind of a long story, but basically I'd done a, a voiceover demo tape. And I'd also done an interview with this company about my experience. And fast forward several years to when I was studying philosophy, the company was just becoming this accessible television service. And they were looking for casual people, just on call people to do, you know, one story a month or something like that. And I was someone that they decided they would give a try. And it seemed like it was a really good fit. I absolutely loved doing it and continued doing it for several years up until the full-time position was posted, which I ultimately applied for and got. But because of that, I don't have a formal journalism background, which is something that I continue to actively look on expanding because it is really important to have as many of those skills as possible. And in fact, it's a good opportunity while I'm at home here to study up a little bit. We have access to you know, LinkedIn learning and stuff like that, where there are a lot of professional journalists who provide courses that you can take, but looking at doing something a bit more formal in the fall. How did you become interested in your profession? Well, pretty much ever since I could walk or carry anything, probably even before then, I've always had a tape recorder. I was always interested in talking and doing impromptu little interviews with people, sometimes to their chagrin when it was like the third time that day or whatever and there's some kid trying to interview you i've always been really interested in journalism and broadcasting and it's pretty much the only thing i could ever see myself doing except for i thought at one point of law but looking back i'm, I'm really glad i didn't go into law because i don't think it would have suited me very well i would have had so much kind of doubt about all the cases i was working on. But yeah, I've, I've always liked that aspect of it. I'm really into technology. So that really fits with my passion for technology as well. And just the variety is, is great as well. But yeah, always been interesting in broadcasting. What does your work involve? And what does your typical day look like? What I really enjoy is the variety of the job. So one of my favorite days are shoot dates where we're, we're out in the field. Sometimes it's at somebody's home to get background interview with them. Sometimes it'll be, like I said, at some sort of you know, a science center, maybe doing an, an interview and a tour with a, myself and a kid, let's say, just to get some different perspectives. Sometimes it'll be you know, at a city hall talking about accessibility improvements in the city but but we're we're going around interviewing people we also have office days too when we're editing and you know stitching the stories together and at the moment i tend to do that by listening in a media player and copying out the time codes into a word document sometimes transcribing the clips and what they say and you know writing some voiceovers to help stitch them together we have a studio in our office as well where I can record my voiceovers. And we have a videographer who is on site with the camera equipment to do the shoots and to edit the pieces afterwards. And we have a producer who is my manager as well as the director and just make sure that all the content coming out of Vancouver is up to the highest quality standards. But yeah, I guess really there's no typical day in the sense that, you know, I'm sort of by the coffee machine every day at 11 and, you know, at one such and such. It's, it's always a variety of stuff depending on the day, which is, again, one of the things I'm very thankful for. What devices do you use? And I have examples if you need them. Braille note, navigation, iPhone, etc. What is your favorite electronic device? I would say that definitely my favorite device is the iPhone. It's pretty much always with me. I don't know how I deal with work email or meetings moving or anything like that with, without the iPhone, but it's also great for your navigation. 
it's all built in and you know requesting an uber transit i could just go on it's amazing to remember what life was was like without these tools but um, i also use a braille note certainly if you want to read and record anything in the studio you know you really do have to have braille you can't really be listening to the speech i wouldn't find that nearly as easy but i'm i'm definitely yeah. a braille guy yeah and then I, I use a computer i use both pc and mac but we use pc at work and other than that i guess just things around the house like a talking kitchen scale and talking kitchen thermometer and just those independent living devices any recommended accessible iphone apps that are like totally free oh that's a good one um that aren't like uber I, and that kind of thing because of course i don't know that i'm allowed to use uber and that stuff yet because i'm not right I use Seeing AI a lot. That's the Microsoft app that recognizes photos. Um, yes, I love Seeing and, AI. Yeah, I find it does a pretty good job. I use Nearby Explorer online by the American Printing House. I also use the paid edition, but apparently that's being discontinued. So free version is probably a safer bet, but it's probably one of the most advanced blindness navigation apps I've ever seen. We use Ira a lot. We actually have it at work and I use it at home. I guess it's not exactly free, although for calls that are five minutes or less, now it doesn't take up any minutes, but can connect yes. you with a trained set of eyes whenever you need them, which, you know, is pretty invaluable sometimes if you're just looking to have something read or I've actually deposited a check with online banking using Ira, which was super cool. I just don't have enough comprehension about the camera to line something like that up myself. Do you live independently? I do. Yeah, I have for just over three years. I live in Vancouver. And I live in a very small condo. It's about 397 square feet, which is super small. So I have actually a fold up bed. And then once you fold up the bed, you can fold down a table. That's how small it is, but it's comfortable. And then the next part of that is, are you married or dating? I'm dating. I'm in like a long-term relationship. We've been together for a couple of years. And then the next part of that is, how did you meet your significant other? We met on one of the dating apps. We met on OkCupid and then met at like a coffee shop. Oh, so you just opened up the dating app and you just looked for somebody and y'all met there and then y'all met in person? Pretty much, yeah. And then the next yeah. question is how do you navigate around your area? So like I heard you mention nearby, explore, how else do you navigate around your area? Yeah, well, when I was in university, it was quite a huge campus. It was a little bit overwhelming and I had a guide dog at that point. Yes, I right can now, imagine. I, and, you know, we did our best, but I'm not going to lie. There was a lot of times when I asked for a hand, we got turned around. These days, I'm a, a cane user. I do use some of the apps like Nearby Explorer and Google Maps if I ever need to get my bearings. But most of the time, I'm kind of doing routes that I'm familiar with. But yeah, I ride the transit as well. Um, COVID has kind of flipped everything on its head. I'm not sure what it's like where you are, but I, I'm not sure that transit is a really safe place right now, especially in Vancouver. And so I've kind of been keeping to myself, you know, isolating it at home. I don't feel super confident about traveling right now. I'm thinking about going back for another guide dog, but again, COVID is kind of thrown it. Anyone who knows you would tell you, I've been thinking about it literally for years and just, just putting it off and putting it off. Because I guess there are different considerations, pros and cons about cane versus guide dog. And I haven't settled on which one I prefer. But with COVID, obviously, all the classes are going to be closed for the foreseeable future. And there'll probably be a decent wait list. So how did you learn daily living skills? That's a good question. So we do have like a, it's called the CNIB or the Canadian National Institute for the Blind in Canada. And they, they offer various services like a kitchen teaching suite that you can visit. So I have done a certain amount of learning through the CNIB, but to a certain extent, it's been a lot of trial and error and just learning through my family 
and on my own. I, I have to tell you that as a kid and as a teen, I will admit that I wasn't super interested in learning those skills, like learning how to cook. And I, you know, I always kind of wish someone had just kind of forced me to do it, although I know that's not very realistic. But suddenly as an adult, it's kind of like, whoa, you know, suddenly I don't always have the opportunity to, you know, cook with my mom or something. So I really have to kind of pick up my socks. So it's definitely been a learning experience as an adult. What is the most important skill that you have learned? I would say... I think there are three really important skills. Can I give you three? Uh, sure, you can give me as many of them as you want <laughs> to or as few of them as you want to. Okay. I would say the biggest one is mobility. I think that there are a lot of incredible programs and instruction in Canada and, of course, in the States and everywhere. But I do think sometimes, depending on who you are and where you live, schools can get a little bit hung up on just getting you through academics. And I realized when I started university, and even when I finished university, that I had very little understanding about basic mobility related to intersection orientation and just things that other people take totally for granted. And I really had to take a step back and realize that I wasn't as independent as I maybe had thought. I thought I was because I actually used to walk to and from high school by myself, but it was just through a park. And, you know, I could get to the local convenience store and stuff like that. But there were some really crucial skills that I was lacking. So that's something that I had to seriously brush up on as an adult. The second is cooking and house cleaning and those independent skills. I'd say the last is reading people. Like I, I miss out on so much body language, which they say is like 99.99% of everyone's communication. <laughs> and sometimes it's easy to overlook the fact that someone is really happy or really upset with you based on just their words. So I guess it, I've just learned that it's really important to kind of emphasize to people to please try and use your words. And, you know, if there's anything that I've done that, you know, you're not cool with, to please speak up and let me know and just kind of check in with people, if that makes sense. I think I would probably tell my 16-year-old self to maybe listen to the others around me who are trying to teach me things that I'm not that interested in because I maybe don't see the value in them right then everything from math to cooking to mobility, because the reality is whether they will make a difference in your life right then, they could turn into stumbling blocks for you later down the road. If you want to do something that you really want to do, but you can't do it because you don't have your math or you, know, you don't know how to get from the bus stop to the venue or something like that. So I think that would be one thing. And maybe just to take it a little easier on myself, you know, attitude wise, we hear all these stories from other people in the community who have disabilities, and you kind of wonder, what's my life going to be like, or you just think about all this adversity that other people are going through and wonder what's going to happen to you just everything, from, I don't know, guide dog access issues, to struggles, finding a job to anything else you can think of. But I think the key is to just do your best and learn as much as you can and be as positive as you can. And that's all you can do. And then another question that's part of this question that's also on the daily living thing is how do you shave your sideburns? So like, how do you know where to <laughs> stop so that you're not suddenly shaving like the whole side of your head and then your <laughs> hair is all uneven and your sideburns are uneven and then you go out somewhere and everybody's goggling at you because your sideburns are uneven and everything else. Ah, uh, yes. Good old appearance stuff that we have to worry about. Well, I had a couple men in my life, like an uncle who I remember got me one of my first razors or sh showed me on his and kind of gave me some tips. But it's basically a, a matter of trial and error. I would say find someone that you trust and work on where the correct spot is to kind of stop shaving and maybe mark that with 
your finger as you're shaving if you feel comfortable doing that. And eventually I think probably the tactile sense will just take over and it'll be a matter of muscle memory. I also use an electric razor that you just shave. There's no real danger of cutting yourself because it's electric and it's safe. And when you're done, you just throw it in the cleaning base and it cleans and charges it and everything. So you're you're good to go. But that is tricky. So then the next question is, do you cook? And then what is your favorite thing to cook? I should disclaim that by saying I don't cook nearly as much as I should. But I think my favorite thing to cook is pasta with meat sauce because it's easy. It's relatively healthy, tastes good. And, you know, you can vary the amount of different spices and stuff that you put in it for a different flavor. But I tend to also do a lot of meats, like whether it's like a rack of ribs or, you know, salmon or whatever that you can just kind of pop in the oven on a pan or a sheet. It's maybe a little bit weird, but I used to do rice in the oven as well. Someone taught me how to do it. Now I can do a rice on a pot over the stove as well. I have to say that the stove isn't nearly as intimidating as I thought. For years, it just seemed like a really scary thing, but actually it's very easy to figure out where the heat is tactually without getting burned. So the last question is, what do you like to do in your free time? I like being outdoors, especially as the weather is warming up just taking walks and stuff like that. I used to be on a dragon boat team, which is kind of like rowing, although I didn't do it last year, but I did it for a few seasons. I mean, that was really fun. Yeah, lots of music and reading. Like you, I'm kind of a techie, so I'm always playing with whatever kind of tech products I can. And sometimes I get to play with them for work too, because we do reviews on tech products as well, which is really fun. Yeah, um, that's how I first yeah. heard about y'all through the original braille note touching of you oh i remember that i was still in my 20s then at this point in our episode we'd like to switch roles and ask grant if you have any questions for christian well christian where do you see yourself in five or ten years or do you have any idea what you'd like to do after high school i actually plan on going and working for apple eventually so humanware or just one of the big tech companies probably more towards apple just because i've got an iphone and an apple watch and pretty much all apple probably more towards apple but one of the big tech companies yeah oh that's really cool and what kind of role do you see yourself, like marketing or or sort of programming? Where, where do you see yourself? I actually don't know at the moment, but I know that right now I'm currently taking computer science one. And next year I plan on taking computer science two, which is basically where we learn like how to program. So last semester we did Python and this semester we're doing Java. And then next year it should be all Java but just more advanced Java. So I'm learning programming right now, but I don't know which part of Apple I'll be working in in like 10 years. Oh, that's pretty incredible. I always wanted to know how to program. I think it's a great skill to have. I feel like it's hard for anyone, but it must be hard for a high school guy to be suddenly just at home this long, kind of everything postponed and everything unstructured. What is your day-to-day life like? I know that I still stay on top of all the virtual distance learning type stuff, but whenever I'm not doing my work, I just kind of sit around and listen to my phone. I'm going to be honest, Mm -hmm. but yeah, but I still try to keep up with all my work and everything. Christian, how did it feel to be interviewed by a professional interviewer? (laughs) how exactly should I explain this I mean it just felt like somebody asking me a question I mean I don't know was it supposed to feel any different than no that's always the goal is to you know not be some announcer guy but to just kind of seem you know just kind of be their their buddy or whatever and just have a natural conversation yeah just to act like it's a real friendly conversation yes Great. So to wrap up our interview, I'd like to ask you, Grant and Christian, to both share some advice for our audience, who are folks who are probably working and studying from home and can't go out as much as we'd like. 
what are you guys doing to stay connected to the people around you and to stay engaged during this time of working and studying from home? Well, one thing that we're obviously fortunate enough to have is technology. So my family and I are doing kind of a weekly conference call. So it's not the same thing as a hug, but at least we can hear each other's voices and and check in. I guess reach out to the community as best as possible. If you have people to reach out to, then, you know, Skype or Zoom or FaceTime. If not, I know a lot of places are doing virtual hangout rooms where you can connect and meet people. And I guess the last thing is more advice to myself than anyone, which is it's so hard to structure your day when you're just at home alone. But I know someone told me that somehow it's easier to get things done if you, instead of kind of doing everything in your pajamas or whatever, you know, you try and keep the day as structured as normal as possible and keep your schedule intact and dressed up properly and again keep your habits as normal as possible that's something i really need to work on so that when we do return to normal it won't be such a shock and maybe limit yeah. exposure to the news at the beginning of covid i used to open up the news app as i was heading to bed and i just read all these horrible stories and then i get really upset and emotional and stuff and now i've kind of learned to spend limited time reading the news I don't know if this is necessarily advice or not, but but I know that Humanware has webinars on Tuesdays and Thursdays for their blindness products and Wednesdays for their low vision products. They're called Humanware Live webinars. And so I listen to those. They're at 11 o'clock Central Time and 12 o'clock Eastern Time. I listen to those and they go over different topics. That's great, Christian. Of course, you listen to the It's My Job podcast, right? I actually didn't listen to my other interview that much because I don't really enjoy hearing my own voice. But yeah, I've started to kind of listen to other interviews. So I would recommend it to other people. That never changes. Hear, hearing your own voice never it sounds natural. It's Dr. Sheffield again. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the It's My Job podcast. What was your favorite part of the interview? I thought Grant's job at Accessible Media sounded like so much fun, but I also really liked hearing his advice for independent living. What did you think? Would you like to be a television presenter? Do you think you will follow any of his advice about orientation and mobility or independent living? Would you like to try out your own interview skills on a future episode of the It's My Job podcast? Or maybe you have a suggestion of who we should interview next. We would love to hear from you. Our phone number is 202-688-5044. That's 202-688-5044. Outside the United States, you may need to dial plus one or your international access code and then one. Be sure to check with your parents first. You can call us and leave us a voicemail or you can send us a text message. If you ask us a question about one of our interviews, we'll try to read the answer in a future podcast. Let us know if it's okay to share your first name and where you're from. Our email address is askitsmyjob at gmail.com. That's A-S-K-I-T-S-M-Y-J-O-B at gmail.com. No spaces and no apostrophe. And you can find us on Facebook. Just search for Ask It's My Job. Each of our episodes is also on Perkins Paths to Technology blog. Check us out and leave us a comment at perkinselearning.org slash technology. And finally, we have a YouTube channel called It's My Job, where you'll find all of our podcasts. If you missed episode eight, head over to YouTube to learn what Christian learned from Chansey about her work as a tech educator and assistive technology coordinator for the New York Public Library. This was our ninth episode, and we want to make many more, but we need your help. If you're a student who is blind or visually impaired and would like to be an interviewer on a future episode, please have your teacher or parent contact us via phone, email, or our Facebook page, and we'll get you matched up with an interviewee. If you're an adult who is blind or visually impaired and would like to be interviewed, please send us a message via email, phone, or Facebook, and we'll get back to you. Once again, our phone number for text messages and voicemail 
is 202-688-5044. Our email address is askitsmyjob at gmail.com. We have a lot to be thankful for in this episode. Thanks to Christian for a great interview and to Grant Hardy for sharing his time as our interviewee. Thanks also to Ms. Hahn, Christian's O&M instructor, for helping get everyone connected. This interview was facilitated by me, Rebecca Sheffield. Thanks to Perkins Paths Technology for the blog posts. Our music is from purpleplanet.com. With so many of us working and studying from home, we hope this podcast is becoming a great opportunity to learn from each other and increase awareness about all the amazing jobs that are being done by people who are blind or visually impaired. Have a wonderful day. 